So what else do we know about antibodies? I mean, where do they come from? Where do they come from? Like they didn't just, you know, they're not coming from a tree, right? They're not coming from a plant. So where do they come from? What's their, what's their biological use? What was that? Right, against the antigens, but why? What's the, what's the underlying thing in antibodies? Where do we use antibodies? Do we make antibodies? Right, we make antibodies. Right, the immune system, exactly. The immune system. So something bad comes along, you eat something bad, or somebody coughs on you, or something like that happens, right? You get an infection, so you have an antibody-driven response, right? So the thing to keep in mind about antibodies, they are very three-dimensional, okay? Everything with them is three-dimensional. What they recognize is extremely three-dimensional, like locking a key, like the, like the key I used to open my room, right? If it's not exactly built correctly in three dimensions, it won't open my, it won't open my room, right? Okay, so it's a very three-dimensional kind of thing, very specialized, very tight fit. Okay, so you have the antibody, and then what's the thing it recognizes? What do we, what do we call that that the that the antibody actually recognizes? The antigen. And we call that specific area, we call that epi, have you ever heard of that? Epitope? Epitope? Okay. So the antibody comes along, recognizes the epitope. So what if our body, like what if we had some genetic defect? Like let's say, for instance, all of a sudden I had a genetic defect, I couldn't make antibodies. What would happen to me, do you think? What do you think would happen to me? If I, if I could not make antibodies anymore, what would happen? Yeah, suppressed immunity, but ultimately what would happen to me? I'd be deceased, right. I mean, they are that important. But somewhere along the line, I don't know where, somebody figured out this idea that, you know, antibodies recognize antigens and these epitopes in a very particular manner, and it was able to open up this whole field of being able to use antibodies to, to use them in biology, to recognize 3D structures, okay? Okay. I don't know if it's on. I think after three days I know how to turn it on, but I still haven't quite figured it out. <laughs> anyway, though, so we're going to talk about antibodies, obviously. So I think it's on. Yeah, maybe there. Okay, so I'm not an immunology guy. Actually, it's sort of strange. I went through all that biology, all those classes, went through a bachelor's degree, went through a master's degree, went through a PhD, and I never had had an immunology class. So when I got to Case Western Reserve, I went up to one of the professors and I said, you know what? I see how important antibodies are. I see how important immunology is because anymore in human disease and cancer and pretty much anything anymore, uh, the immune response is really, really important. And I just did not have a formal knowledge of it. So I actually sat in on an immunology undergraduate level class. But, I mean, it was hard. It was a hard class, though. And I didn't get a grade because it's like, I'm just taking it for, you know, to take it. He wanted me to take the test, though. I did all right. But, but I learned something. It was good. So I guess, the, you know, you just got to keep learning. You got to keep realizing what you don't know. So it worked out pretty good. But again, I'm no immunologist, so if I say something that's totally wrong here, please, if you know better than me, please correct me. Okay, so we talked a little bit about what an antibody is. It's a, you always see it shown like this basically as a Y. You always show them as little Ys, the letter Y. And what you have is you have part of its variable, you have an antib antibody bind or antigen binding site, okay? Good job, right. And as we talked about earlier, if you didn't have these antibodies and their ability to recognize invaders into our body, then your immune system wouldn't be able to recognize them, your immune system wouldn't be able to clear them, and you'd be overwhelmed by infection and you'd be dead, okay? Because uh, we've seen, I think in the past, you, you guys have heard of like the bubble boy, something like that. I, I can't remember exactly what the defect was, but he had a really awful immune system. I can't remember what the genetics was behind it, but, but basically no immunity, had to live in a bubble, you know, couldn't, couldn't be exposed to anything because it would be death. So very important. And then, like I said, 
somewhere along the line, somebody realized that, hey, we can use this to our advantage in, in terms of measuring biology because they're absolutely fabulous at recognizing three-dimensional structures. Okay. Okay. So what we're going to use it for, obviously, is to recognize our protein or our molecule rest of, of interest. So what is a protein, right? What is a protein? It's a string of what stuck together? Oh amino acids, right? Amino acids, AA, amino acids. And they're different. You have, you know, cysteine and tyrosine and I think there's about what? How many are there? Like in the, like 20, right? 20. I haven't, I haven't done the biochemistry in a long time, but right, 20. But, you know, depending on how they're hooked up the order, that's basically what makes the protein. And depending on your order, depending on how it folds, depending on the structure, that's what allows that protein to do its job. And when you look around the, in biochemistry and stuff, proteins are the things that do work, right? They do the enzymatic work. They do other things like that. So the ability of an antibody to be able to recognize a certain sequence of this is, is what lets the antibody actually bind to that sequence, okay? So keep in mind, it's not just that not just a cis tyrosine you know, string of amino acids is recognizing, it's recognizing the three dimensions. Because you've all seen those pictures of how that protein folds and it you know, has a, what do we call it, a secondary structure or a tertiary structure. And then I think if they come together, a quaternary structure, a protein. So an antibody is very specific. It might recognize you know, the primary structure, but it won't recognize if it's folded. It just won't recognize it, okay? So what do we use these things for in in modern biology. <coughs> so you said you've done Western blots. And yesterday I talked about immunoprecipitation. I've done activations and blockings with them. Uh, but in this course in particular, we're going to use it for cellular and tissue localization. Like I said, you do a Western blot. What's a Western blot tell you when you do it? What's it tell you? It tells you it tells you a little bit about structure, but it tells you quantity, exactly, expression level, right. It tells you how much, and, and it tells you like what, and what abundance. But, we, but to do a Western blot like we have here, obviously we took the tissue and we usually grind it up, so we've lost all information about where something is in the tissue. Like, like if I took an eye and I ground it up and I looked for, you know, alpha crystalline or something, I would think it's in the whole eye. And but it's primarily in the lens. So by immunocytochemistry or immunofluorescence or whatever, we could determine by using an antibody that it's actually in the lens, not, you know, not so much in the retina or the cornea or another part of the eye. But at Western, it would just tell us it's there or it's not there. Okay. So the advantage of, again, using a microscope to be able to see where something is, to see where you know, something's located. Okay. So... Now, obviously, you can't get into real detailed, you know, antibody talk here. Plus, I'm probably not capable of it anyway. But let's just take a look here, a couple general themes about antibodies. Usually, when somebody comes to me, the first question I'll ask them is, do you have a polyclonal antibody or do you have a monoclonal antibody? Okay. Polyclonal antibody, a lot of times, is, is in a rabbit. So does anybody here know how do you just in a real general way, make a polyclonal antibody in a rabbit. Anybody? Well, you take a needle, right? And then what do you do? Any ideas? Any ideas? You take your protein interest, right? You purify it. Then you inject it into the rabbit. And then the rabbit thinks that this is a, a foreign body, a disease entity, something's wrong. So the rabbit is going to make an immune response against it. It's going to generate antibodies. Okay. So then if you take the serum of that rabbit, then it should have the antibodies in it that it's directed against that. Now, the thing about polyclonals, <coughs> I mean, you can purify them a little bit and stuff, but they're not totally clean. Plus, they seem to, they're a collection of antibodies that recognize that protein. Okay. Because that rabbit, you know, the rabbit wants to live. Uh, <coughs> through evolution or whatever, 
it, it, it decides it wants to make a whole bunch of antibodies against every little bit of that protein it can to try to protect itself, okay? So polyclonal, many, poly, right, many? Many clones, many things, multiple epitopes recognized, polyclonal. Whereas monoclonals, uh, we have a, actually, where I work, we have a core, like I'm a, so my, my core, we support eye research at Case Western Reserve. We have me, microscopy, we have a tissue culture woman that does all tissue culture. We have a hybridoma core, okay? Uh, we have a molecular biology core that does genotype, and we have women that take care of our mice for us. So the hybridoma core, though, she is involved with making monoclonal antibodies. So monoclonal antibodies, sort of the same idea. You inject the mouse, and it's a little more detailed. They fuse with the uh, myeloma cell, and details beyond me a little bit. And what it does, though, is it recognizes a single epitope. It's a clone. It's a mono, a one, you know, single clone. So it's a single clone that recognizes just one epitope. Okay. So big difference. Polyclonal recognizes many. Monoclonal <coughs> recognizes one. So when I did my PhD back in 1998, I got it in 1998, I worked on chicken. Okay. So... What kind of animals do you guys use here? I mean, what, like what kind of experimental animals do you use? You use mice. I think, I, some, I think some people told me they use something aquatic, but what? Fish, 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 mice, anything else? Insect. Right. Rabbits, do you guys use rabbits? No, no. Okay, anyway. Uh, so the thing is you have antibodies <coughs> can be made from different sources. A lot of times the polyclonal is made from a rabbit, and a lot of times the monoclonal is made from a mouse in general. I mean, there's exceptions. What is that? Is the reason why polyclonal always in rabbit? I wouldn't say it's always in rabbit. It just, it, it's just the rabbit's an easy system to work with. It's a pretty big animal. You can get a decent amount of antibody out of it, and it's easy to work with. It's just sort of, it's just sort of the way it is. I don't really know what the explanation is. When you get into secondary antibodies, a lot of times you'll see they use a goat or a donkey, a much bigger animal, so they can get more out. But I think a rabbit's just a lot bigger than a mouse, and I think historically it's just easier to work with, is my guess. Other than that, I don't know what the reason is. I'm sure there is a better reason, I just, I'm not aware of it. But I guess what I'm getting at is, like I said, I worked on chicken, okay? And now nobody was going around back then and making an antibody against, I worked with uh, type six collagen and chicken. And nobody really had made an antibody against type 6 collagen in chicken. So I had to find an antibody that was made against maybe type 6 collagen in mouse or against type 6 collagen in human. And I hoped it would cross-react with my type 6 collagen that was chicken. Because the sequence of the chicken type 6 collagen or the mouse type 6 collagen or, you know, different species type 6 collagen all might be a little bit different. Okay, they probably got some regions that are similar, without a doubt, they're conserved, but there might be some differences. So if you're using a monoclonal against, say, say I got a monoclonal that was made against, a, say, a human, and I tried crossing that into my system, and I hoped and prayed really, really hard that it would recognize my type 6 collagen of my chicken, chances are, I mean, it may work, but I'd probably be better off using a polyclonal right? Because it recognizes more epitopes. So chances are, because it recognizes more epitopes on that type 6 collagen, I got a better chance to use something, you know, that's made, that would recognize my chicken with the polyclonal antibody because it recognizes more. So it's like you people in fish that work with fish, you know, I'm sure not everybody's out there making antibodies against certain proteins in fish. But if you're trying to use an antibody, hey, maybe it works in mice or it works in you know, something else, you might be better off trying to get your cross-reaction work with the polyclonal. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Does everybody get that concept, what I'm trying to say? Because it recognizes multiple places, chances are when you try to go to a different species, you have a better chance of recognizing it with the polyclonal probably than a monoclonal. I'm not saying a monoclonal won't work, but chances are you might have better success with that. Okay. 
so this is just a brief comparison between polyclonal and monoclonal. Okay. Uh, polys are inexpensive. Basically, you inject the rabbit, more or less. Uh, you know, take the serum. That's I mean, pretty much it. You can clean it up a little bit and multiple epitopes. Can have a lot of variability, okay? Because it's multiple antibodies. Once you make a monoclonal, the the woman next door to me, Denise, that does this, she'll come up with one and she'll be able to freeze that cell line down, these, these hybridoma cells. Once a hybridoma made is a constant renewable source, she'll freeze that down and she can make it again and again and again and again. And it's a clone, so it's the exact same thing. And some of the stuff she's made over the years is just, I mean, you know, it, it's worth a fortune. Because as we'll see, if you get the antibody that really works for what you're doing, it is worth everything. It is, you know, it is a critical tool in biological research to have a really good antibody. So you'll see that's why there's all these companies selling them, all these companies uh, that, you know, sell variations of antibodies, different antibodies, different tags on them, and so on and so forth. It's, it's big business. Okay. So remember, you can have batch variability, polyclonal, because sometimes I'll have a lab come and they've been doing something for years and it works every time and then all of a sudden it quits and we'll find out it's from a different lot. Like maybe they injected a different rabbit or something and it just doesn't work anymore. Whereas this over here, a monoclonal, you don't get the variability. So it should work again and again and again and again if it worked. Okay, so when you go to buy an antibody, they're fairly expensive. It depends. I mean, they have different, different expenses. A lot of times uh, when somebody goes to start an experiment at our place, they'll come to me because I talk a lot. Go figure. But I talk to a lot of people. I know a lot of people on campus. They'll come to me and go, hey, Scott, do you know if anybody works with, you know, Protein X? I'll say, yeah, maybe. And they go, well, you think we get a little antibody off them? And, you know, maybe I could try an experiment before I go spend the money or something. I said, sure, sure, sure. So I do a lot of that. I do a lot of uh, wheeling and dealing, I guess you could say. Trying to, you know, progress people's work. Trying to make people's work be a little easier. Like, because like I said, my job is to make your job easier, right? So I try to do that. But the thing is, is when you go to select one, you look in the catalog, and you'll see something like this. So here we are looking at anti-alpha smooth muscle actin, okay? It's made in rabbit. It's a polyclonal against alpha smooth muscle actin. So if you're working on alpha smooth muscle actin, this might be a good uh, thing again, you know, a good antibody for you to use, right? But let's look a little farther. It works for ELISA. Has anybody ever done ELISA plates? Like you take, you have, you've done ELISA plates? So you take the plate and you put the antibody in there, right? And you read, now did you read it out fluorescence, fluorescence wise? What? A spectrophotometer, right? Okay, so you read it out with a spectrophotometer. You guys used to do ELISAs, I think, yeah. Okay, so if you looked at this, you'd buy, you know, you say, if I'm gonna do ELISAs, this might work. It'll work for immunocytochemistry, immunocytochemistry, immunofluorescence. Okay, the reason they put these in here is not all antibodies will work for all applications. So don't go buying something for immunofluorescence and, and the only thing it says is ELISA or Western blot. Okay, chances are it might not work for immunofluorescence. They may. They don't do every test, the companies, but they, but they do have proof usually that that particular antibody works for that particular application, okay? So keep that in mind when you buy them, okay? So like I said, always try to check the antibody you want to use has been tested for your application, okay? If it's not on there, I mean, it's not, you know, and you really can't find it anywhere else, it might be worth calling that company and say, hey, is it, have you guys tested this at all? Because it might not be in the catalog, but they may have tested it, okay? Or, of course, you know, my favorite answer to everything, right? Look in the literature. Did somebody else use this? Because sometimes you can call the company and they can give you a list of, like right here even, references. Okay. So, look in the literature. See how they used it. Okay. Okay. So, the big thing to keep in mind, I get this, I get this all the time. All the time. So, people come over, we do the experiment, and they go, well, I worked on a Western. I say, okay, so I worked on Western. This isn't, we're not doing Westerns today. We're doing immunofluorescence, right? Think about what a Western is. A Western, so what do you do with the Western? What do you do with the tissue to start a Western? You 
you grind it up, right? And then you denature it. You run it through a denaturing gel. So when you denature a protein, you sort of destroy this structure and you sort of make it open up a little more. So now you've exposed all these other little epitopes that, that here might be hidden in a fold. Like in the immunofluorescent world, your epitope might be hidden, but the Western antibody, Western blood antibody, can come in and recognize that, but if you try it over here, it's hidden, right? So that's the difference. That's why you want to look at this chart, at least to get a handle on, hey, does it work for me? And look at the references too, okay? Because they're expensive. These things are expensive. And nothing more frustrating when they don't work. The other thing to notice here too is like we talked about cross-reactivity. Here it's telling you what it crosses with also. So not only it tells you what techniques, but it sounds like they've tested this on mouse, they've tested this on rat, they've tested this on chicken, and it'll, it'll work. Okay. So, you know, if you work with rabbits, you want to work with, or if you work with guinea pig and you want to look at smooth muscle actin, this might, you want to do a western blot, this might be the antibody for you. Okay. Okay, so by denaturing or not denaturing or, you know, leaving it in a native form, different epitopes are available. It can be different. So take home message, one antibody doesn't necessarily work for all techniques, and one antibody isn't going to recognize all the different species either. Okay? But like I said, a lot of these things have been tested, a lot of these things have been figured out, so take advantage of that. Okay, this came up just a little bit ago. We were talking about fixation, right? So I worked on a, <coughs> one lab, Dr. Medoff. You remember Dr. Medoff? You're probably trying to forget Dr. Medoff, but okay. You remember Dr. Medoff. Anyway. <laughs> he worked upstairs from us. Uh, he was an interesting guy. And he wanted me to do some projects, and I started staying in some tissue. I don't know why I did it, because usually I don't do that lately, but he talked me into it. And I had trouble with this antibody at first, trying to make it work. And then the one guy in the lab said, well, you can't fix the tissue. You can't fix the cells. I was like, what? It's like, why didn't somebody tell me that when I started? I mean, you know, I just assumed. I made the mistake of assumption. Uh, so on that particular antibody, it only worked when the cells were not fixed. But most of the time, fixation, like again, going back to those catalogs, it'll tell you it'll work with this kind of fixation sometimes or that kind of fixation, or you look in the literature. Because I've had some antibodies, for whatever reason, you have to acetone fix. It's the only way it works. I mean, they're very unique. Think about it, though. They're unique, trying to recognize a unique structure. You're trying to use a 3D key to fit in the 3D lock. It's very specific. So don't imagine anything working that shouldn't. And, it, and of course, this is all happening at the molecular level too. Okay. So sometimes the type of fix will make things change if it works or not. Bottom line, these are not trivial things to take on. Okay. You, you've got to put some time and effort into it. You've got to look at different things. Uh, like I said, always the preparation, the preparation, the preparation to try to ensure success. Don't just start doing the experiments. Think, think it through first before you start wasting your time and spending money. Okay, they're all very unique. Okay, so I've made it sound like they're really hard, that it'll never work now in a million years, but they obviously work. People publish papers all the time. People come to my lab. We take pictures. Things work. So how do we get it to work? Again, the literature. Call, ask. Now, the big thing, though, is this right here. <coughs> Find something in the literature or something that says, this staining will work in this tissue. Because, again, I'm in a core. I see a lot of different things. People come over, and the, the boss says, hey, he wants to see if this protein is expressed in brain. And I'll say, is there anything in the literature? And they'll say, no. I'll say, OK, so it's a mystery. Well. So they did the staining and it didn't work. It's like, did the staining not work because it didn't work? Or did the staining not work because it's not there? Okay, it's super hard to interpret something like that. So in that case, we definitely need some kind of positive control. Okay, so you've got to look in the literature, find out where that protein is expressed if you have that problem, and, and get a positive control that you can do the staining on to make sure at least the staining is working. Okay. Negative controls, we'll get in that a little bit here, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, 
But once you have your positive and negative controls figured out, then it's time to do the experiment your boss really wants to do. Like your boss wants you to do, you know, four time points with six different dilutions of a drug. So, so a lot of people come to my lab with the four time points. They spend hours and days on this, and they'll do the six different dilutions of the drug. They'll do everything. They'll come over with, you know, 20 slides, 40 slides. I'll put the first slide out of the thing, and I'll go, it didn't work. And they'll look at me and go, what do you mean it didn't work? I said, it didn't work. Well, look at the next slide. I'll look at the next slide. It didn't work. Look at the next one. It didn't work. It didn't work. So make your positive and negative controls work first. Make the, the easy system. Make it work. Then do the experiment. Never do the experiment first. Make it work first. Then do the experiment. I have really good researchers that come to work with me. They'll spend two, three weeks making things work before they actually undertake the experiment. Yeah, it's a pain, and it's a lot of work, but if you don't do it, you're not going to get anywhere, okay? So do it in advance. Do it, plan ahead. I mean, you're probably getting tired of me saying this all the time, but, but science is, I mean, science is hard enough, so you've got to, you know, do everything you can do to ensure success. Okay, now this is pretty nice. I don't see why you couldn't access this in India either. So when I worked... Years and years ago, we worked with this thing called, uh, the antibody was called CSAT. It was uh, against the beta-1 integrin in the chicken. I think it was actually made in the chicken, or against chicken, if I remember correctly. But this is a nice thing called the Developmental Studies Hybrid MMA. And what it is, it's like people who've worked with the NIH and had grants and stuff with the antibodies, they deposit their antibodies to this group. I think it's, yeah, it's a hybrid MMA, so it's all monoclonals. But, I mean, commercially, the... The, the antibodies were like, you know, four or five hundred dollars, and we were getting two or three times as much for like twenty dollars. So it's set up by the government, it's like a government repository. I'm not saying your protein's gonna be there, but it's something definitely worth looking at because the cost is better, the quality is very good from there. I've gotten other ones from there. Uh, it's just a good resource that, you know, so like it says here, supernatant cost forty dollars, not two hundred dollars. So it could be you know, a good money saver for you to take a look at that website. I don't know if you have something like that in India. You may. There may be other ones in other countries. I'm not aware. But, uh, but look around. But this one definitely is available. <coughs> okay. So, again, we're not doing Western blotting in this course. We're not doing immunoprecipitations in this course using antibodies. We are doing this, immunofluorescence. Okay. So there's two ways to go about this. In the one, this would be our, I guess I sort of drew that wrong a little bit. Oh, that's weird. Anyway, okay, so pretend this thing isn't here, right? Pretend this is just sticking right down. So we have a fluorescent tag on one antibody. Okay, so we have taken our primary antibody. The primary antibody is defined as, what do you think the primary antibody is? Anybody got an idea? The primary antibody is the one that recognizes your, right. So the primary, this is poorly drawn. I guess I should have caught that when I looked at it. This, this little piece shouldn't be, this should be just sticking here, okay? That's sort of weird. Oh, but anyway, so this shouldn't be, this should be sticking right down to it. So it'd be the primary antibody right here recognizes the antigen should be sticking to the antigen, okay? problem with that is then you have one antigen, you have one antibody, you have one fluorescent signal. It's not very bright. The other way to do these experiments where I see probably 90% of the time, and we'll talk about some of the reasons why we see this primary, secondary versus just primary in a minute, is with the primary antibody, this would be your primary antibody that recognizes your antigen, okay, recognizes your antigen, and then because this is unique also, like, so say this was goat anti-mouse. Say this was made in a goat and it recognized uh, a mouse antigen. So what would happen then is you could then put in a secondary antibody that just recognizes goat IgG, goat antibody, okay? So you'd put these secondaries in and it would come in and it would only stick supposedly where you have the goat. So the nice thing about this though, there's multiple binding sites, so you could stick multiple of these, so you could expand that signal. You can make that signal a lot brighter, okay? 
So that's one of the big advantages, secondary, a primary secondary system versus a primary system. Does that all make sense so far? Everybody understand? Okay, because it's going to get a little more detailed coming up. So if you don't get this, you're just going to get farther lost in the woods. Okay, you want to be like, don't want to be like Little Red Riding Hood if you know who Little Red Riding Hood is. You know who Little Red Riding Hood is? You do? So that's over here too. Yeah, right. the big bad wolf and all that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, don't want to be like her. <coughs> okay. Okay. Like I said, I've used primaries in the past. They're nice because it's very clean. Because if it's a well-made antibody, it should only recognize that antigen. It should only stick in that one spot, and it shouldn't stick to other things. So it can be very clean. It can be very expensive because a lot of times you buy that primary antibody commercially, you'd put your own tag on it. Like they have these kits from like in Vitrogen and stuff where you can tag an antibody real easy. I mean, I've done it. It's, it's real simple. It's a few steps. Has anybody else ever done it? Put a tag on an antibody? Anybody? Anybody? No? So it's real simple. That's like a couple little columns, add a few, you know, add a few solutions put it on a column, clean it up, take it out, your antibody's tagged. Problem is though, it doesn't tag all your antibody, so you waste some, and the primaries can be extremely expensive. So it could be an expensive undertaking to do it this way. Uh, a lot of times the protocol's a little quicker because you don't have a secondary step. The disadvantage is you don't get this amplification, you don't get that you know, multiplication of the signal. It can be tough if your target's in low abundance especially. So. Uh, if you're looking for something that's in low abundance, quite often you'd want to use the secondary system just to make everything brighter. Okay. The other thing is, I, I, I haven't brought this up to this point, is like if, if you have all the choices in the world and you have, you're looking at two proteins and you know one's expressed very low and you know one's expressed very high in the same tissue, you always want to try to use the green on the one that's expressed higher because the green's brighter and it just seems to work out better. Or the, you want to use the green on the one that's expressed lower. Okay. So that's one of my preferences. I always like to use green on my lower antibodies because that, that green fluorochrome is really bright and stuff. Okay. Again, this is primary antibody only. Okay. Primary, secondary, like I see, this is what I see all the time. Amplifies your signal can use the same secondary of many primaries. So if you had a whole bunch of, you know, if you're working with a whole bunch of different proteins, you have a whole bunch of, say, polyclonal rabbit antibodies, like so you say you have five or six polyclonal antibodies in your lab, well, you could buy one secondary that would recognize those polyclonal rabbit antibodies. So you could save a little bit more money too. And a lot of times labs will swap them like, you know, again, they'll come to me and say, hey, to somebody, and I'll call down the hall, and they have it, or some other lab has it. So a lot of times we're, you know, swapping around secondaries. Okay. The, it's a little more tricky to use the other ones, these secondary, primary, secondary systems. <clears throat> and there's also a higher background due to the cross-reaction of the secondary with the tissue. I mean, nothing's perfect. These are nice three-dimensional locking keys, but they don't always stick where you want them to. So when you throw an extra secondary antibody in there, it may stick non-specifically to spots too, okay? Which you don't have that problem with the primary only. You shouldn't have that kind of background. Okay. The other one to watch out for is mouse on mouse. And I'll get to that in a minute, I think. Whoops, let's go back. So just keep this in mind. We're going to talk about this in a little bit. But mouse on mouse is a killer, and we'll get to it. Okay. So tomorrow I'm going to present like more fo formal protocols, okay? I'm not going to do the formal <laughs> protocols now. So this is sort of like a quickie through on protocols, but tomorrow we'll get a little more formal in the steps and things like that. So this is sort of an overview kind of thing. So I figured, I was talking to Sreeja, what order should we do this in? We decided to do it in this order, okay? So this isn't total protocols, but we'll get to that tomorrow. Okay. Okay, so we're assuming here, at least in this setup, that things are fixed. Okay, so we want our primary antibody to bind our antigen, and then the secondary antibody to bind specifically to our primary, like we just talked about. So the primary might be made in rabbit, or this primary will be made in rabbit, and we'll recognize our antigen, which is human. Okay, this, 
This is our secondary antibody, which obviously I wrote this wrong. So has anybody seen my mistake here, what I did wrong already? It should be good anti-rabbit, right? Right. This is what happens when you write stuff, at, you do PowerPoints at 2 in the morning. This is what you get. Okay. So it should be good anti-rabbit. Correct. My mistake, I would have screwed the experiment up and uh, probably been fired. Okay. So good you guys saved me. Okay. Okay, so what we're trying to achieve is specific binding of the secondary to only the primary. Okay, our primary. I was trying to get into the animations here. So then the secondary should only stick to it, right? But you can have multiple secondaries stick to it that would amplify your signal. Okay, but the problem is your secondary antibody can bind non-specifically to things other than your primary. Like I said, you have your tissue, you have all this tissue, all these different molecules in your tissue, and it might stick in places you don't want. So it's sticking to something non-specific, like a non-specific antigen. And that's bad. This is background. Okay. It leads to high background. How do we stop this? By blocking. Okay. Now, this is a general rule. It works pretty good. The general rule is you use serum from the host of the secondary to block. So here I fixed my mistake. I went with rabbit. So in our example, we have a goat anti-rabbit secondary. So what are we going to block with? So we're going to use serum from the host. So what are we going to use to block? We're going to use goat serum. Right. If it was donkey anti-rabbit, we'd use donkey serum. Okay. Uh, I mean, a lot of labs don't have donkey serum laying around, goat serum, things like that laying around. But... You could try maybe donkey on goat or goat on, you know, it might not be perfect, it might work, but I've had examples where we couldn't get anything worked exact except the exact serum you needed. But in general, that is the rule. I just, not a whole lot of rules in this kind of stuff, but this is definitely one of them, okay? Okay. And usually what we do is goat serum, isotonic, and PBS, usually between 2 and 4%. Sometimes we'll go a little higher. Usually we won't go much lower, but often we'll go higher, okay? So this is that non-specific. You use goat serum to block it. Then your secondary won't stick to it, right? Okay. Does that make sense? That's the block to try to prevent background. Okay, so let's set up a basic immunofluorescent primary secondary staining with the tissue already fixed. Okay. So section on a tissue slide. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so this is our antigen. This is our non-specific, right? So we put on our primary. We're blocking, right? The block will prevent the secondaries from sticking over. Whoops, from sticking over here. I guess. Well, it's blocked, so the secondaries only stick up here. Okay, that's basically what you're trying to do, and a more visual kind of sense. And like I said, tomorrow we'll go through more protocol, protocol. Okay. Like I said earlier, don't give up. This stuff's not simple. It's just not easy. There's many variations in the fixatives, stainings. Of course, you know, I can't talk about all of them. If you got something in particular you want to talk to me about, feel free. I'll give it a shot. But a lot of times you just got to go through it and do it and see if it works because they're very unique kind of things. Uh, here's a pretty good page I found with some protocols, this one you'll have in your PowerPoints. And the other thing is, when it comes to secondary antibodies, I don't play around. This company's the company, okay? They are the best. There's no doubt about it. And remember I said I was on that confocal list serve, like all the confocal people around the world, that yeah, it's an agreement that they are a really good company and they seem to make the best secondaries. A lot of what they do is they will, with their secondaries, they'll make sure, like if you want to use it on Rabbit, they'll like, they'll like what they call pre-absorbed, they'll make sure their antibodies, their secondaries don't cross with other things too. So they take like that extra step a lot of other companies don't. And their, their technical support people are just off the chart. Okay, they're just really, really smart, and really, really helpful, and really, really good. And I've spent hours and hours and hours and hours on the phone with them, and they're just 
super helpful people. Okay, they're not paying me. Okay, in case you thought they were. Nobody's paying me, really. Anyway, okay. So, controls. So, people come to me all the time and say, oh, did my staining work? And they'll, you know, we'll look at a slide and I'll go, okay, where's the control? And they look at me like, what? Did it work? I said, I don't know. I, I can't. I cannot interpret what you gave me without a control. Why is that? Well, for instance, let's look at this one, secondary antibody control. If you give me a slide that has just a secondary antibody in it, then I can see what's nonspecific, right? Because we talked about a secondary binding in a bad place is nonspecific. So then I have a handle on what's nonspecific. Now, if I see a different pattern on your slide, then I'd probably say, well, okay, you know, we might be getting there. It might have worked. An isotype control. So this one is basically you do everything the same side by side with your antibody of interest, and then you pick an isotype. And what I mean by isotype, like the same kind of IgG subclass, but it's a totally irrelevant antibody. It has nothing to do with what you're working on. It just serves as a control to see if something weird's going on and it's sticking somewhere, okay? So if you do this control and this control, and then the other control I like is nothing. And what I mean by nothing is just no primary, no primary or secondary. This just shows the autofluorescence. So if you give me this picture, this picture, this picture, and your sample, I can usually interpret what's going on, and I can tell you, yes, it worked. But if you come to me and you say, did it work, and you have none of this, I have no idea. I have no idea what I'm looking at. Am I looking at something totally nonspecific? Am I looking at, I don't know what I'm looking at. You need these controls to determine what's going on. What was that? Okay, so isotype control would be like this. Uh, let's see. Oh, I got it in my hand. Okay. So let's say you're looking at, like that example, actin. Okay. So say alpha actin. And let's say that the antibody against it is an I. G, G, subclass one, okay? Like you can look all this up about it. So what I'd wanna use as an isotype control is I would try to find some irrelevant, so maybe something against like rho or something, some weird signaling thing. But I'd find something that's against rho and it would also be an I, G, G1 antibody. So then what I'm doing is I'm controlling for this idea of these subclasses being the same. It's an irrelevant antibody. It shouldn't maybe stick to my system or it might stick in a different location, but it tells me that nothing strange has gone on. And what I'm actually seeing is the real staining, not, not some strange cross reaction or something between the secondary and this for, for whatever reason, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. okay. But you've got to do the controls to be able to interpret the results. It just, it's impossible to interpret the results without the controls. Okay, and then again, positive controls are really nice because you know then that the system worked. So what I tell a lot of people, I see a lot of immunology, like we talk about immunology is big. Uh, it's just a big field because it's with cancer, it's with you know, straight immunology. It's with a lot of different things now. So what I told people there, I see a lot of staining for TB cell. You know, if you're cutting up a mouse and you got some tissue, keep a piece of spleen around full of, you know, different immune cells or thymus full of tons of T cells. These are great positive controls for, for things like this, okay? So really when you cut up a mouse, might as well save a lot of different things. Save liver, save this, because you might need it somewhere down the road as a positive control for something if you're going to be working with mice a lot. Or, or your fish, same thing. Keep the other organs. You never know, you might need it. Okay, mouse on mouse. So what this is right here, this is retina, my favorite tissue again, okay? This is secondary only, okay? The secondary only here was, I forget, goat anti-mouse or something like that, anti-mouse though. 
So anti-mouse recognizes what? It recognizes mouse. It recognizes mouse, probably IgG, which are usually immune cells, right? IgG is on immune cells, usually. So what this is actually, you're looking at vessels in the retina, blood vessels, because what it's done is the secondary only is non-specifically stuck to them. So a lot of people are running this mouse on mouse because you're using, you know, the, the antibody you've made and what you're targeting are the same. So you get this cross-reaction like this. So, so be aware of that. Okay, any ideas I just told you? Uh, so the, the usually the best solution to this, if you run into this kind of problem, is just see if you can find an antibody. Maybe you can find one made in a rabbit or something else that might work to get around this. That's usually the easiest solution to get around it. Other than that, you could try a mouse on mouse kit or call Jackson Unilabs and they can talk you through a solution with fragments and things like that. Okay, but as long as you're aware of it, then you know you can look into fixing it when the time comes. Okay, and like I said, lastly, the most common question I always get is my staining work. So a couple other little things here about it. So let's say the controls look good. The controls look good. But the thing to keep in mind about antibody staining is the pattern different? Like is your pattern, like the pattern you see in the tissue, the staining itself, does it look different than the other controls? It should, I mean, the, the staining that works should give you a different pattern. And then again, if your protein of interest is in the nucleus, well, when you look, it better stain in the nucleus, right? It shouldn't be staining out on a cell membrane. You shouldn't get that ring pattern, you should get a nuclear pattern. Okay, so you know, look at the pattern. Does the pattern make sense? And the other thing is, is you're staining brighter than the background. I mean, with these bright dyes and if things work, it should just pop. Like you look and it just pops that it works. I mean, it's just boom, you know, like stars in the, bright stars in the dark night sky. Okay, so remember we talked about intensity the other day in Metamorph and I told you that number is the most important thing on there, the intensity number. So what I like to see minimum, minimum of signal, what I would consider positive to what I would consider background, I like to see at least be three times brighter to call it a real stain, okay? But it's gotta meet these other criteria too. It's gotta have the pattern, it's, it's, it's gotta be brighter, and the control's gotta be good. If all these conditions are met, then hey, your staining probably worked, you're good, okay? Because in the literature, or you know, when you go to publish and stuff, they're gonna wanna see the controls, okay? So you're gonna have to do them sooner or later. And some, they might want to see the intensity data, too, okay? Remember, a good antibody works is worth its weight in gold, right? It is worth its weight in gold. Whoops, I went too fast. Okay, but anyway, I guess I turned it off. Any questions? So you're going to have to think back here a little bit. Some of this is from yesterday. And then some of it might even be from the first day. Because I went to a math lecture one time. Like my son, he's a math teacher, and he told me to go see this one professor who's a really good professor. And the guy was. The guy was just absolutely phenomenal. And the one kid asked a question. He goes, uh, are you going to ask questions about what we learned, like, you know, two weeks ago in math? He's like, he goes, well, yeah. He goes, I'm asking things that, you know, you learned years ago in math because, you know, like addition, subtraction, it's all math, right? It all just builds up on itself. So, yeah, I mean, anything's fair game. It's his math. So the same thing here, we're, you know, the whole course is fair game when we ask questions. Because the last day I got to give like a, like a quiz, is it like a written quiz or what? The, like you told me to write like 30, is that like a written thing? Yeah. Okay, okay. So there will be a quiz eventually too, okay? So keep that in mind. Okay. So little discussions here, little interaction, and let's see what we got. Okay, the resulting images from a confocal taken from the top of a specimen to the bottom of a specimen is called what? A Z-stack. A Z-stack, yes. Are we doing prizes today? Okay. So there's extra incentive here. Okay. You probably have no idea what you got, but what it is is, like in America, like you guys are... Like, your money's bad now, right? They took all your money away from no, you or no, something, no, I heard? No, something no, like that? No. They took some of your money away from you, right? They took two of your monies away from you. Okay, well, we have this monies. 
that's these coins. These are dollar coins, actually, right? But nobody uses them. It's just weird. It's and some of them are old, and some are whatever. But I mean, it's it's you go to America. That's a dollar. I mean, it's it's a dollar in America, and I got a lot of them laying around, and they're just they're they're pretty. I mean, they're nice looking coins, but we use the paper usually the dollar. Okay, but they're cool looking. But that's an American dollar. Okay. <laughs> It's a special American dollar. Like if you came to America and you looked around and around and around, you wouldn't find that. It's very special. Okay. Okay. Next question. From yesterday, I don't know why I wrote from yesterday. What does deconvolution? What does deconvolution do? Deconvolution. Deconvolution. Right. You increase the specificity, but what's a little bit more about it? How did I use it? Like, what context did I use it in? 3D, to some extent. To some extent, it's a poor man's confocal, right? Because it uses what? It uses an... It, it, it tries to make the image look like it's... It doesn't have been Right, it doesn't have pinhole. That's right. You're using a wide field to start with. You're right. I don't have that many coins, so somebody gotta get the whole. Somebody gotta put the whole thing together. Right, it's it's wide field. But but we're using what the deconvolution is actually an a big long word math that starts with an A. Right, but it's a it's a mathematical. A what? I mean, everybody's getting right things. Okay, so you're taking an image that's sort of blurry, right? And you're making it better because you're using math, a mathematical ah, algorithm. Okay. <laughs> Somebody finally got it. Okay, this is another one. This one's eyes an hour, actually. Okay, he was the president. And you look at the back. The back's really cool. Yeah, it's cool. It's the big eagle, the symbol of our country. What's the symbol of India? Like the animal. You have like a national animal? Okay, everybody answered. <laughs> okay, now this will be the this will be for the prize, this one, but you gotta raise your hand. Okay, you gotta raise your hand. But in 3D we call the same thing. <laughs> okay, next question. <laughs> So this is like in Jeopardy. Like in Jeopardy, if you buzz in too early, like you shout out the answer, he's like, well, you didn't buzz in, so no, it doesn't work. But you lose money there, so. Okay. Okay. To publish papers in modern biology, you have to publish in at least what bit depth? 12 bit. Should I give some of these too? I'm not very rich, so I don't have a whole lot of these, but I had a few laying around. Okay. Next. Okay, we're going to do a couple true and falses, but these won't count. Okay, because true and falses are too easy. Okay, true or false. Co-localization proves that two proteins must interact with one another. You can all say this one. You can all say this one. What was the question? <laughs> Co-localization proves that two proteins must interact with one another. Must interact. True or false? False. false. Right. Because it, it proves they're in the same area, but it doesn't prove they interact. Okay. True or false? Wide field microscopy is better for a thick specimen than is confocal. False. That's false. Because remember, the whole idea of the confocal is you can get the the blurry light out of the way. So the thicker the specimen, the more scattering, the more blur, the confocal has a better opportunity to get rid of that blur and, and nastiness. Okay, another true and false. True or false, if you increase the speed of acquisition on a digital camera, you also improve the resolution. This is a trick one. I don't know if I really talked about it. Something like you guys heard think about it. It's false. Because to go faster on a digital camera, you have to, you will lose resolution, okay? 
And this is one thing I didn't get into, which is good to ask this question. Let me just, and the, the gentleman brought it up yesterday. He mentioned the word. I said, man, how did I forget talking about that? But I did. Okay. Now, if I do something called two binning, okay, what I'm going to do actually is this. I'm going to take two by two pixels. I'm going to combine that into one pixel, okay? So I'm going to make it into a bigger pixel. Okay, there's two things that happen because I do this. The two things that happen because I do this is, well, how many pixels do I have now? Now I have more or less pixels total. I'm going to have less because I just took four pixels, made it into one pixel, right? So I have less pixels. So if I have less pixels, I have less spatial resolution, right? I have less spatial resolution. So when I bin, I have less spatial resolution. Okay, but my pixel now is bigger though, right? So because it's bigger, should more photons hit it or less photons hit it? more photons will hit it because now it's a bigger area, right? So if more photons hit it, it is now more sensitive. So my numbers, my values, my gray values will go up faster because I have more photons hitting that pixel because now it's a bigger pixel, right? So binning gives you less spatial resolution, but it gives you more sensitivity. Sensitivity, okay? The other reason I do it on my systems is, okay, so each pixel is a, a bit of data, right? So now, instead of having a million for each image, if I've been at two, I now have, I don't know, whatever that is divided by four, so like 250,000 pixels. So I have less data for the computer to deal with, so my system can handle it better too, just in terms of storage space, and, and not only storage space, speed. So anytime you start to bin, because remember that first day, he showed that picture to Golgi and everything looked like just a bunch of squares, but he was measuring the data. What he was doing there, he was probably binning by four, or maybe even, probably four, eight. So his spatial resolution went bad. That's why everything looked real pixel. But his sensitivity went up. So he was able to grab more photons. But anytime you do this with binning, you can go faster too, because, because the sensitivity is greater. You can just go faster to get to the value you want. So when you see pictures like that, that's a lot of binning, and it's increasing the sensitivity. You lose spatial resolution, but it lets the camera go faster. That's why he was doing it, because he had to go fast. Okay? So it's just a concept I forgot to bring up that I should have mentioned. And we do some metamorph stuff. I'll show you a couple of pictures that might help clarify it a little bit. But, uh, and the other main reason is definitely space, because you have less data. The pictures are smaller, and it really helps my system from crashing. Like if I tried to do all my stuff at one, it would just crash. Because in terms of why it goes faster is it has to read out a million pixels of binning a one. I have to get those millions of bit, a one million piece of information over. Whereas with binning, I only have to get 250,000 pieces of data over so, you can, so the camera can run faster. Okay? So a lot of advantages to a little bit of binning. And really, in reality, there's so many pixels here anyway, that decrease in space resolution really isn't going to hurt you much. Okay? Okay, something I should have mentioned the other day. Okay, back to Jeopardy. Okay, okay this one doesn't count either. What is everything? Okay, that one. That one you, everybody's got. That's good. Okay, true or false? This one doesn't count either because it's true or false. Averaging during a confocal scan is a bad idea and it makes the image worse. Yes. False. False. Because remember what averaging is. Averaging was you would scan the image, and then if that same dot was in the next image, you'd keep it. And if it was in the same one again, you'd keep it. But if it was only in one, you'd get rid of it. Because chances are if it's only in one out of four, it's probably noise. Or if it's in four out of four, it's probably your signal. So averaging increases the image quality. It makes everything a little slower, but it increases the image quality. Okay. Okay, back to money. 
Okay, ready? <laughs> this will be a money question. You got to raise your hand. If your specimen is very thick, what type of quant folk will probably give you the best chance for success? You already got paid. <laughs> okay. If your specimen's very thick, out of the different types of types of confocals we talked about, what is your best bet to try to get one that works? Two photon, yes. You get a General Eisenhower, Dwight Eisenhower. He was president in the fifties. Those are called Eisenhower dollars. Okay. okay. What type of optical microscopy will give you the greatest resolution that we've talked about this week? I mean, it's in the name. What type of microscopy? Now, this is a money question. Money question. So you're not in. You're not in. You're out. What what technique do we talk about? Optical microscopy will give you the most resolution. Stop. What? Stop. Storm, yeah, you're right, but you're not right. You're right. You're right, but you're not right. But what's that whole generalization called? Super, Super resolution. Right. Okay. You got it right, because storm's right, but it's not 100% right. Okay, I'm broke, but I got a couple other things. Okay. Okay. I think I have to send a plane to come get me, because I don't have any money to go back. All right. Okay, what technique that we talked about lets you study the membrane, cell membrane dynamics? For a pen. For a pen, for a pen. Yes. Here you go, here's a metamorph pen. There you go, you can just hand it to her. All right. So you guys have a saying like all work and no play makes Jack a doll boy? You ever heard that one? All work and no play makes Jack a doll boy. Is that the same saying here? Is it? Who's Jack though? We don't know. Okay. Okay. Well, I read the question. I don't remember the answer. Okay, that's not good. Okay. Okay. Okay, if you need to, using an optical microscope, and you want to prove that basically two proteins are very, 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 very close, then, now if you're already one, you can't participate, okay? Then, okay. Right. Okay, I killed that list of questions. Let's try another side. Okay, this is this is for a for a mouse pad, a metaphor for a mouse pad. Okay. I should have kept I should get this for myself. You see how bad. Now does anybody actually use a mouse anymore? Or do you all use <laughs> like this? I mean who still uses a mouse, like the old fashioned mouse? I do. I have a heck of a time with these. You do. Oh you then it's good you won. It worked out good. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so this one's a little bit more technical question. You got to think a little bit. Okay, so can GFP be fixed? And if it can be fixed in a cell, then, then what do you have to keep in mind? What's a couple things you have to keep in mind? This is a raise your hand question. Raise your hand, raise your hand, raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> Good job. Right. So usually what we do is I, I really I usually don't even worry about it. I just put my like we'll talk about doing slide stuff tomorrow. I just usually put my mounting media on there and I just put my cover slip on and I don't worry about sealing it. Because it's got enough stickiness to the mounting media, it just stays. 
And there's two kinds of mining me. There's kinds that get hard, and there's kinds that don't get hard. Vector shield, right? But there's a vector shield that'll harden. No. Yeah, well, there is. There's there's a kind of vector shield that will get hard. Like if you leave it, it'll it'll get hard and become solid. Hard so if I'm gonna do oil, yeah, hard, hard mount. Mold right, hard mount, normal mount. So the hard mount one, if you're gonna do oil immersion, like high mag, the objective is actually gonna touch the glass. Then I use the hard mount one. I usually use the hard mount one. The thing about the hard mount one is some people are in a hurry, so they'll they'll you know put the stuff on the slide. The mounting media, they'll come over to me, it's hard mount, and they'll come over to me right away. And I'll look at it, and everything's floating. Because the, mount, the hard mount has not settled. And until and everything's blurry, because the hard mount has to settle and dry, and then it, then it maintains a refractive index. But before that, the refractive index is just bouncing all over the place. Things are just in the way. So if you do use the hard set, usually you usually got to let it go overnight before you look at it. Or at least, at least three, four hours. Okay, what we got left? I might have some more stuff back in my hotel too. I have to look. I don't know. I brought some stuff. I was cleaning my house out for different things, and I said, "Hey, let me bring some stuff." Okay. Uh. Okay. If you're trying to stain a protein from a chicken. Are you more likely to have success using a polyclonal or a monoclonal antibody? Okay. Okay. Now for, for the last mouse pad today. What is an epitope? You already won, you already won. <laughs> The site where the antigen. Good job. Okay. Like I said, I think I got some more things for tomorrow too. I'll have to look what I got. Remember, you got to raise your hand. We got to. Okay. See, I went out of order and I don't remember what I asked. Okay. Uh, okay. They got to raise your hand. What is apoptosis? It is. It's programmed cell death. Okay. Uh, yeah, I need, I need one. You should see how bad mine are at work. I probably need two, actually. Maybe three. Okay. Okay, why do we block a tissue section? Why do we block a tissue section? Why do we block? But why? What do we, why do we do the block? Okay. I'll run out of questions. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this is another one. Raise your hand. It's the last one, I think. I might have some more stuff tomorrow, but I got I to look. I got to write questions, too. Okay, if you use a dye like Mito Tracker, okay, we talked about Mito Tracker today. It looks at the mitochondria. There's two reasons I said to use it. What are those two reasons? There are two reasons you could use it for. Well, you won, right? You already won? Did you already win? <laughs> Somebody over here won. Did you win? Not yet? Oh, you won. Okay. Okay. What? Right. You could see mitochondria. And what was the other reason? There was another reason I said. You could use mitotracker, and then you could do something else and use it as a... What? You could use it as a, okay, so the answer was you, you could use it as like a marker. Like say my protein, I think it's in the mitochondria, so I could stain with mitotracker and then stain for my protein. If they're in the same spot, they co localize, then yes, my protein's probably in the mitochondria. <coughs> <coughs> no, PDT was just, that was just an example. PDT was the, the drug that that guy used in that picture, that's all. <coughs> okay. Okay, true or false, you gotta raise your hand though. <coughs> it's an easy one. If an antibody works on a Western, it will work on immunofluorescence every time. True or false? False. 
<laughs> okay, we're going to save this one for tomorrow then. Because I'm out of questions. Okay? <laughs> okay. But it happens. But if anybody's got any pictures, I'm here tomorrow still. Next day. And then, like I said, you can send me stuff back in Cleveland. Feel free. Okay, anyway. So this is a stack. Okay? This is a, a stack. And Z. And we were talking about, remember, looking at different things, right? Okay. So, one thing we could try here is, let me take a look at one thing. Okay. So, remember we were doing the circles? Like, we were doing, like, what would our intensity be here? Or what would our intensity be here? Right? Well... The one thing you can do, because you're in a stack, is you can look at that intensity through the stack. And even if this was a time stack, okay, this isn't necessarily a time stack, but if it was a time stack, you could look through time, but here we're going to look through Z. So what you can do here is you can actually measure the intensity here. Uh, we'll say all regions. Okay, so what we can do while we're waiting for that to come back, uh, does anybody have any questions about anything we've talked about up to this point? Anything. I mean, anything. Feel free. Anything we've talked to about up to this point. Like, if you want to talk about your particular experiment, we can talk about that. Anything? Okay. Okay. So like I said, a lot of you were talking about doing protocols for staining and stuff. I'm going to talk about that kind of stuff tomorrow. Okay. So what was the big difference today? He talked about all that electron microscopy. So what would you consider the big difference between electron microscopy and what we've been talking about, optical microscopy? What's some differences you think? What's the biggest difference? Color. Resolution. Right. Without a doubt. The resolution on an electron microscope just literally blows the, you know, just is just so much better than an optical microscope, it's not even funny. But what's the, what's the big difference? What are, we, what are we talking about today? What was one of our topics today? Right, so can you do live cell on an electron? No, that's the, that's the big drawback to electron. You just, you can't do anything live because that beam is so powerful, it just destroys everything. So electron has its place and you know optical has its place. I guess is a good way to look at it. Also it is, True, true. But remember, all the fluorescent images we're generating here aren't color. But but you're right. Like when we take a picture of that H and E stain, or we take a picture of that oil red O stain. Does anybody remember what oil red O stains? We talked about it like two or three days ago. Lipids. Lipids. Exactly. Good. Good. So those kind of things are true color. And what do we call true color? What bit? We call true color. 24 bit, exactly. Because it's an 8 bit blue, or an 8 bit red, an 8 bit green, and an 8 bit blue, right? Okay. So, oh, I'm back. Okay. So I got a stack here, right? And if I go over here to Metamorph in region measurements, and I click on this little thing here, instead of current plane, I say all planes. Okay. What it's telling me right here is let me configure it. I can put down uh, image plane. So it says in image number one, image plane number one of the stack, I have an average of 938. The next one, 946 for, let's just use one circle. I don't want to make it too confusing. Okay, so what it's able to do, it's not only able to just measure on that top. Remember we talked about like a deck of cards, right? It's not able to just measure the, the top deck of the cards. It's able to measure all the way through the cards. So what it's giving me here is showing me the different planes, right? 
okay? It's showing me the different planes, and then it's showing me the average intensity for each plane. The other nice thing about Metamorph, then, is let's say we go over to here to the graph, and we could say we're looking at plane number versus average intensity, right? It'll let us build a graph, too. So we could look at it as it went higher in the planes through this circle. If we look, the intensity went down, okay? And remember what we said. You look at that last one, you go, wow, that's really bright, though. That looks really, really bright here where I have my cursor. And if I look at that first plane, I'd say, man, that, that doesn't look quite as bright. So what's the problem here? Because the last one does look brighter, right? Agreed? We'd all agree with that, right? This looks brighter inside the circle here in plane number 48, right? But our data says that our average intensity is only 906. But it looks pretty darn bright in there, right? But if I go back to the first plane, and I look inside that circle, it says it's 17, 1,700, or let me go back to the first plane. It doesn't look quite as bright, but the intensity is higher. How, how do we explain that? Not quite threshold, but remember what we talked about. The data is the data is the data. Right? No matter what the data looks like, right, the pixel values don't change. So don't get fooled. Like, it doesn't matter. If we do this, look at the intensity values. They're still the same, right? Nothing's changed because the data, remember we talked about that yesterday or the day before about how I told you If I had a graph, remember I said if I had a graph like this, and this was 10, and this was 20, and this was 30, right? And we draw the axis how big? Remember we did this a couple days ago? Yeah, yeah we say 50, and it'd be a nice looking graph. But if I drew it, it would look really silly, okay? Well, that's what this is here. I'm playing here with the scaling. So I'm playing with that axis to make it look weird. Okay? The data is the data, though, right? So even though it might say, it might look brighter, this is the truth here. Because what I'm doing right now, I'm looking inside this circle, and I'm going through each plane. There's 48 planes here. <coughs> and I'm actually getting the, the data, the intensity value from this circle in each one of my deck of cards. Does that make sense? Okay, because remember, the way it looks means nothing. It's all about the pixel values is the important thing. Okay? Okay, let's see what else we got here. Okay, say you had something like this, right? How could we go about counting these cells? Like how many cells do you think we have here? Right, and it doesn't matter if it's black and white, right? It's irrelevant. It could be red, it could be whatever. But how could we go about counting these black dots? Okay, well, what do we have to apply to the image first? Make a partition or a segmentation or a thresh threshold. So if I do a threshold on dark objects, then what it's doing, let's take a look at this. What is it doing? Now, I guess this is a, this is an 8-bit image. Okay. How do I know? 
how do I know this is an 8-bit image? Like, I just looked at it, but I know it's an 8-bit image. Because remember, 8-bit goes between 0 and what? Remember, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. 8 times is 256. So if I'm moving my cursor around, see this number? Right? The brightest number I see is right around 255. It doesn't get any brighter than 255, so I know I'm working within 8-bit. And that's fine for this image. Okay? But what I did is I thresholded, and what I said is we just want to look at pixels between 0 and 30. And by looking at the pixels between 0 and 30, or segmenting the image, breaking it into different spots, it's turning those orange to all the pixels that are between 0 and 30. If I said, let's go higher, but if I just went between 0 and 30 in this case, it's a nice segmentation that lets me just look at what we, what we would call our, I don't know, nuclei here or something, right? And what I could do here very easily is I could count these then. So I can go to Measure, Integrated Morphometry Analysis. And now I can not only count these, I can do something else too. So let's take a look here at this menu. This is the counting part of Metamorph. It's under Apps. It's called, or it's under Measure. It's called Integrated Morphometry Analysis, okay? This is what lets you count. So the way it works, it only is going to look at what's threshold, okay? <coughs> It will not look at anything else in the image. It will just look at what's thresholded. So we've, we've applied our threshold, okay, here. And now we have all these different crazy things we can measure. Okay. So let's look at select measurements. Metamorph is full of measuring. The problem with, the problem with modern software, and I'm sure you see it on your computer too, is there's almost too many things. There's so many things that it's, it's like overwhelming, okay? So let's look at some of these. Let's look at area. Okay, so let's say we want to measure area. We don't just want to count how many of these circles there are. We want to know how big each one of these little orange circles are, okay? And we also want to know how intense they are. How bright are they? So we're going to measure average intensity also. And then we're going to try something else. We're going to measure something called shape factor. Okay. Okay. So we're going to use those measurements. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure. And then what Metamorph does is everywhere it sees something it wants to measure, it turns it green. So it took those orange things and it turned them green. Let's look at the data. Okay, if we look at the summary data, it counted 265 objects on this image, okay? The average area is 127.67, okay? Does it make sense what it's doing? It's looking at all the data here. If we go through it one by one, we could say, well, wait, I wonder, I wonder about the specific data on this one. So I can click on it. Metamorph will tell me, okay, that one has 151 area. The average intensity is 1.3. Uh, don't worry about centroid. And then shape factor is 0.918. Okay. Shape factor is something I use a lot. Because sometimes what I'll get is I'll get things that are like long and thin and things that are circles. And they all threshold because they're all the same intensity, okay? But what I can do sometimes with Metamorph is, let me see if I got a better image to do that on. Eh, maybe not. Okay, but what we can do is we can actually sort on shape factor. So if we had objects on here that were like long and thin, what we would do is like see all these shape factors are all getting towards one because these objects are very close to circular. So let's say we wanted the ones that are almost perfect circles for whatever reason. We want the ones that are almost perfect circles, but not quite. Okay, like this one here that's yellow has a shape factor of 0.198. This one here has a shape factor of 0.69.
But we'd agree this one is not as circular as the other one, right? Okay, so let's say we just want to look at objects that are almost circles. Because I use this a lot. Like I'll have cells, like I'll have two different kinds of cells, and one will have a nucleus that's long and thin, and the other ones will have a nucleus that's very round. Okay, so I will use shape to do my filtering. I will use shape to do my sorting. I mean, I could, sh I could, I could sort on intensity. I could sort on size. There's a lot of different things I can sort on, but this one, for right now, I'm gonna show you how to sort on shape, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, I only wanna look at ones that are greater than or equal to, and we'll make this, let's just say zero, I always have trouble with this thing, zero point eight. gonna fight with me. Okay, let's measure again. Oh, I know why, because I got a filter. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna measure again. Okay, orange is not being counted, green is being counted. So what I did here is if you look at the ones that are green, they look more like circles. Whereas the ones that are orange look more like, more like sausage or longer or something, right? So what I did is I used the image analysis software to say, hey, I just wanted to look at the ones that are more circular. So I use shape factor to my advantage here, okay? Because like I said, sometimes I have an image where I have two different kinds of cells, and I just want to look at the one kind of cells, okay? So I want to look at the more round cells. So I could use shape factor as a filter, okay? Now let's say I just wanted to look at bigger ones. So instead of using shape factor, let's look at our area data. Okay, so. Let's take a look at something like this. So 129, 151. Let's say for whatever reason, we just want to look at things that are bigger than 140, okay? So what we could do we can sort on area, okay? Okay, and what it did, it just kept the biggest ones. You probably can't tell by your eye, but what it's saying is all the green ones here, oh wait, that'd be greater than or equal to 140. Let's look. I always get confused. I guess I didn't pay attention to that damn math. But yeah, all our ones now are bigger than 140. See our data? So what we did this time is we sorted on actually area. Okay? So orange is bad. It gets thrown out. Green is good. We keep it. So the green ones are actually the bigger ones. They're all bigger than 140. The orange ones get thrown out. But you see, the idea is you can, I guess what I'm trying to tell you here is you can sort by different measurements. You can say, hey, this is more round, let's keep them. Or this is more round, let's throw them away. This is bigger, let's keep it or throw it out, okay? So it's like the next level of image analysis. And sometimes what I'll do is I'll actually use shape factor and area. So I'll, I'll, I'll sort by shape and I'll sort by size. Just trying to tease out from here what I want to get, okay? Depends what the question is. Depends what I'm looking for. So I'll do that like that, okay? Any questions? Does this sort of make sense what I'm trying to do? I'm trying to show you you can sort by more than just intensity. You can sort by intensity, too. Yeah, you can sort by shape. Because a lot of times you get, I mean, the best example is I get two different kinds of cells. And I'll have dappy nuclei, they're two different kinds of shapes. Like some will be fiberglass, this long thing, and some will be round. And then I can sort and just count the one kind I want instead of counting everybody. Okay, so it's all about... But none of this works unless you threshold correctly, okay? Okay, let's go back here to this idea of binning again for a second.
I definitely need the mouse pad probably because I need the other kind of mouse. But anyway, okay. Okay, so I've got these three images. I took these on my camera before I left Cleveland because I wanted to talk to you about binning. And we talked about binning a little bit, a little bit ago, right? Okay. So if I want to fairly, I want to be fair, and I want to compare these three images, and I want to make sure that I'm looking at them apples to apples, like we said. I don't know if you use that expression here, but everybody seems to understand what I meant, right? I want to be fair. Like we said, what, you guys use mangoes to mangoes maybe. I don't know. But anyway, what do I have to do to make sure these, these are equal in intensity so I'm not fooling myself? What do I have to do? Does this work? Do you remember? Remember the, we just talked about up here, remember the scaling? The scaling, I was talking about this axis here, right? So what I have to do is I have to make sure that my scale for each of these images is the same. Okay, so if I make this Let's say I make this image, I look at everything between 0 and 16,383, where I'm bending at 1. And then here, I'd have to make those numbers the same, right? Remember, to make it fair, right? So now this one's scaled at 0 to 16,383. And then to be fair, I'd have to do this one at the same thing. Okay. So what do you notice about these images? What, what would you say if I just said, hey, what's the difference between bin of one, bin of two, bin of four? Just, just looking at the image. What's the trend? The trend is what? Well, are they all the same size? Are they the same size or different sizes? Well, they look different sizes to me, right? I mean, the bin one looks big, the bin two looks smaller, and the bin four looks smaller yet, right? Okay, which one's the brightest? Number bin four. Bin four. Okay, exactly. Right, because I made it. Because I made it. I made them the same scale, so it's a fair comparison of brightness. So yes, bin four is the brightest. Okay. So. The reason I show this, remember we talked about binning and what it was. It's making the camera, giving it bigger pixels and making it brighter. The exposure here is exactly the same. Like when I took these pictures, I used the exact same exposure. And how do I check that? Remember I told you about Metamorph, get this little eye? We go here to show annotation, it says 70 milliseconds. Binning for bin four, four by four, it tells me right there. Right, 70 milliseconds, 4 by 4. Okay, if I look at bin 2, 70 milliseconds. And then if I look at bin 1, right, 70 milliseconds. They're all the same picture, different binning though. Okay, but the other thing is remember what we got going on here is we have less pixels too. Because if I look here now at bin 1, I look at the size of the image. See right here? 1392 by 1040. Number two, bin two, would be 696 by 520, right? So remember this idea. You make the pixels bigger. More photons of light hit the pixel. It gets more intense faster. You have more photons hitting, the, the gray values go up. I mean, look at these gray values here. It's probably just about saturated, it is. Whereas here it's a little bit saturated, not quite, and then here it's darker, okay? The reason you do binning, you save computer space and then you can go faster too. If you wanna take more frames a second, it makes sense because here you only have so many pixels. Let's look at bin four, how many pixels? You have 348, by 260, right? So you could dump that out to the, to the computer much faster than a million pixels, 
okay? So binning is about going fast. And like I said, if we think back to that very first day where he spoke and he showed those squares, it looked very pixelated, right? Because he was just showing data is what he was showing. Because if I look at this picture, if I try to look at this picture, do you get a lot of these? A lot? Is this pretty common? Right. We get in the U.S., we flip out. I mean, we just go, what the heck just happened, right? I mean, it sort of throws us for a loop. We don't get that many. Once in three, four years? Yeah. We'll get like a 20-minute one once every three years or something. Unless we get a big rainstorm or something. Okay. So what else can we talk about? Let's see. What else do you want to talk about? Anybody got any ideas? Anything to talk about? No? Anything? Has anybody learned anything? We've learned something a little bit. So what other stuff? I mean, anybody else? Do you have any ideas of what else you want me to talk about the next couple days? Because I'll have some time, hopefully. We should have a little more time tomorrow to actually get on the quant focal because I will actually have help because I think some of you are going to be doing electron microscopy and then I can actually go on the quant focal. Because the problem with me going on the quant focal right now is if I go on the quant focal right now, then there's nobody here to talk to you. So that's sort of the problem with having one, like one main instructor instead of a couple, I guess. Uh, okay. Let's see if this thing comes back. But does all this image analysis stuff make a little bit of sense? I mean, I know it's not going to be like, you know, crystal clear yet, but at least you're exposed to it. You see it. I think as long as you see that there's a tool out there that lets you measure. As a, because, you know, if you're taking the time to do the experiment and getting all this data from it, It'd be nice to measure as opposed to just, you know, showing a picture in a paper. Because, you know, science, like all your other stuff you do, you measure, right? You do a Western blot, you measure how much is there. You do PCR, you, you measure how much is there. It's all about measuring. And, I mean, these are pictures. You might not be used to measuring, but image analysis is the measuring part of pictures, okay? So it's, it's definitely another thing in your bag of tricks. Uh, you know, if you get really, really good at this, there's a... Definitely a lot of jobs out there because not a whole lot of people do this stuff like full time all the time kind of deal. Oh, okay. Okay. So like we were saying, the idea of binning. It lets you use less pixels, bigger pixels, brighter pixels, and then it lets you go faster. So the application you saw there today, he probably binned by four or even higher to get those kind of images like that. Okay, let's close all these. Open. Okay, there's another thing I want to talk about with cameras that I sort of forgot about the other day. Okay. And since we're here, see, usually I show this demonstration, usually I do it in my lab with my camera, but I don't have access to that today. Okay, there's something else on a camera that you can control, and it's called gain. Okay. Now, if I want to compare these fairly, what do I have to do? These three images, what do I have to do? I have to set, remember, I got to set my scaling the same, right? Let's take a look at the scaling. Okay, it's 0 to 16383 on that one, 0 to 16383 on that one, and 0 to 16383 on this one. Okay, so all these images are equal. They're all equal comparisons. I took them, so I know I took them at the same exposure. I could look at it too, but I, but I know I did, because the whole idea was to show you what happens when you have the same exposure looking at gain. Okay, so this time, what would we say about these pictures? Well, are they different sizes or the same size? They're the same size. Are they all the same intensity or does somebody look brighter? Right, the farthest one's the brightest, right? Gain six. Okay, what gain is, you can use it on a camera, it's a multiplier. All it is is a multiplier. It multiplies the signal, okay? So if we look over here, 
at our favorite number, the intensity value is around 4,000 or so. And I go over to this one, they're more like 16, 18, you know, a lot higher than numbers. And if I go over here, they're higher yet, right? So gain multiplies each pixel, okay? But it's a dirty thing. It, it multiplies each pixel, but it doesn't just multiply the signal. It multiplies what else? It multiplies, mul multiplies the noise. Right. It's a, it's a dirty thing. The application for it is if you have something that's really, really bright and you want to go really, really fast, then you can turn the gain up. Okay? But it's dirty. It's noisy. Whereas binning, when you do binning, it preserves the signal to noise ratio. Okay? But gain is just some on the camera that lets you turn it up. So don't be fooled. Like I said, always go back to the idea of looking at the pixel intensity values here. Okay, that'll tell you the truth. But gain is another thing you can do with cameras to turn them up to make them brighter artificially. Okay. Nobody has any images? No? Okay. You don't have any images, do you? No. You didn't know, I, you didn't know I'd be asking you for images. Okay. Some of my old images. Exactly. Okay. 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 So we looked at this the other day, right? So what kind of stuff could we do on here? Like a lot of times I get something like retina thickness. People want to know how thick the retina is. So remember we talked about one way we could do it? We could just draw a line. We could draw another line, right? We could draw another line. We could draw as many lines as we want. And then remember, what do we call the lines in Metamorph? We call them, what do we call them? I'm helping you. What do we call them? We call them regions. Exactly. So if we go to measure regions, right? Remember we talked about this? We could see how many regions we drew. We could get the distance of each of the lines we drew. Then we could open a log. We could plot all that data to Excel, right? That was real simple kind of stuff we could do. Okay. Okay. And then what kind of image is this one? What is this? I mean, it's, it's H and E of the retina, granted. But what, what kind of bit depth do we have going on here? We have 24-bit color, right? How do we know that? The three colors, right. See, the one nice thing about Metamorph, if you have the three colors overlaid, you can turn, turn them off as you go. You can turn them all off. Okay. Okay. Let's see what else we got. Okay. Okay, so my boss is, we're in Department of Ophthalmology, but she wrote another grant. And she works with Alzheimer's. Okay. Okay, so what do you think that that's an image of? Remember, the, well, I mean, what, what's your guess? What do you think that tissue is? Any ideas? Okay, this is a, this is a section of brain from a mouse, okay? Brain from a mouse here. Uh, what it is, is this is an awful lot. You can see here, you can sort of see the stitching pattern if I make the contrast really severe. Okay, so you can tell, like I took a picture, took a picture, took a picture. So this is stitched together, you know, probably hundreds of images. That, I forget the magnification, maybe 20x to look, at a, to look at a mouse brain. Okay. Now, her thing is she studies Alzheimer's. Okay, so does anybody here know much about Alzheimer's? What's Alzheimer's disease? It's a, it's a degeneration of the brain, and what happens to people who have it? Right, memory loss. Right, I had a mother-in-law that had it. I had a grandfather that had it. It's it's hard. I mean, it's a tough disease. It's a tough disease to deal with because they people just 
get to the point they don't even know who they are and they don't know who you are. So it's a, you know, it definitely, it'd be a beautiful thing if we could cure it. That's for sure. Especially since we're all getting older every day and, you know, unfortunately some of us probably will develop it. Okay. But anyway, the hallmark of Alzheimer's is what? Did you ever, I don't know if you read much about it. Formation of plaques. Okay. So what this is here is this is a mouse model, an Alzheimer's mouse model, where they've got plaques. And what we're able to do is we're actually able to stain these plaques with the fluorescent antibody. Okay? So what we can do then is my boss is trying to develop drugs to treat Alzheimer's or to slow Alzheimer's or whatever in this mouse model of the uh, uh, in the mouse Alzheimer's model. So what do you think the experiment would be? Think about it. Think about it. If these are plaques and we're looking at plaques, what would be an experiment you could do? You could take one mouse, take the other mouse. They're both, they're both Alzheimer's mice. They're both going to develop Alzheimer's. So you give your drug to this mouse, not to this mouse. And then you put these side by side after, you know, six months, eight months, and you count the plaques. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Did the drug work? Did the drug, did the drug prevent plaque formation, right? I mean, it's a pretty straightforward, simple experiment. But it's a good use, again, here of image analysis. So these are nice and bright. We did a pretty good job, actually, uh, taking the pictures from what I remember. Okay, so what I could do is, let's say that. So I'm highlighting now what I would consider my plaques, correct? Okay, let's blow this up a little. Take a look. Now, it's a monster image just because, again, it's, uh, what do you call it? It's, it's hundreds of images stitched together. So what I did here is I said, okay, I've made everything orange that I would consider a plaque. Or did I? If I look at off, so what I'm going to do actually, I'm going to crop this out. Because it, the math, it, it'll take too long on the computer because the, the image is so big. So I'm just going to work on this part right here. Okay. Edit. Okay. So if I look underneath this, let's threshold this. Okay, if I look underneath this right here, okay, you gotta love when software doesn't want to behave itself. So I need copy of copy. Or when the user error. Okay. Okay. So the green is supposedly representing the plaques, right? But I don't know if I'd call that a plaque right there. It seems awful tiny. I don't think I'd, I'd want to call that a plaque. Are also becoming orange? Right. The reason they're becoming orange is I am thresholding. I am using pixels of that value to look at those, okay? But what I'm saying is, I think something like this orange right here, see this? That's too small, that's probably not really a plaque, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure. I'm gonna take all this stuff off. Well, I guess we could leave it on, we'll see what we get. And I'm gonna measure this now. I'm going, to, I'm going to make this monochrome because what it's going to do is going to turn the positives green and it'll be hard to see. Okay, maybe I should make it yellow or something so we can see better. Okay, but see what it did? It Let me get rid of that filter. So it went through, it found all my things I marked orange, and it measured them. So it said, okay, I've got, if I look at the summary, 
copy of copy, measure again. It says I have 261 plaques here. But like I said, this, this one here, I don't really like it. I think it's too small to be a plaque. Okay. So like these ones here, they're like two and one and really, really tiny, like six. I don't think any of those are really plaques. So what do you think I'm going to do to get rid of those? How am I going to get rid of those? What can I do? What can I do? Not average, but I can filter, right, on size. Maybe I don't want anything under the size of 10. Okay, so see what it did? See how it turned the real little ones orange? It threw the really tiny stuff out because I wouldn't call that. Well, it's hard to see that. Let's make it bigger. We'll never see it. I could see it up here, but barely. Let's say 100. Okay, so see what it did? It threw these other areas out orange. So what this would be, this would be a size sort. I would just keep these green ones, and I would call those my plaques. Okay, now, if I took my picture of my mouse that was not treated with any drugs, and then I took my picture of my mouse that was treated with the drug, okay, and I did the same staining to both of them. I did the same staining on the same day to look at the plaques. And then I used the microscope the same way and took, took the pictures exactly the same way. I apply the same threshold to both images, right? I apply the same threshold to both of these, okay? And I use the same size sort we just did. I keep everything the same. Because remember, image analysis. What did I say images are? They are, I guess with an M, math, right. Right, you either love math or you hate math, right? So if you do something to one side of the equation, the experiment, if you do the same thing to the other side of the experiment, you keep everything equal like in an equation, right? Like you're taught in math. If you do it to the right, like if you divide by 2, you've got to divide by 2 on this side, right? Same thing here. Think of it as math. So the one mouse with no treatment, I have to treat exactly the same as the mouse with treatment. Then when I actually do the analysis and I get the numbers, that's fair. I can compare those and I can say, you know what? I did this so many times. I did this experiment 15 times and I've got a difference that shows that my drug seems to make less plaques. And uh, you know, you take it through statistics. You got to go find somebody good in math because every time I did statistics, I had to go find somebody good in math to do it. Now my son's a math guy, so I could use him. But then you could publish that, okay? So you see how it works? It's like you can use image analysis as a tool. I mean, pretty simple here what you're doing and a pretty simple experimental design, but it's, it's pretty powerful, okay? Okay, and that's exactly what my boss is doing, and they're working on getting their paper published. Uh, so we'll see. And hopefully the drug, you know, a lot of times you read these things like how a drug's really good in a mouse, or a drug works really good on a rat or something, but getting it to the, the human level is a whole different world. But at least, I mean, you got to start somewhere, right? You can't experiment on people, so you got to start somewhere. Okay, so does that all make sense? What we're trying to do there, just, just using image analysis there in a real world application. Okay, design it, you know, fairly simple, straightforward experiment. Okay, so it definitely has this usage. And like I said, you know, think about this in your own work. Okay, let's see what else we got. Am I on the internet or not? Uh, maybe not. It doesn't really matter. Let's see what else we got in here. Okay, remember what we talked about yesterday with the confocal? Here's another stack. This is, so what this one was, this is similar to somebody showed me yesterday. I can't remember who it was, but somebody showed me something. It was you, right? Okay, that's right. So this is actually retina. And 
what we call this, we call this retinal pigment epithelium. And what this stuff is here, this red staining, this is a, uh, it's between two cells. It's a, it's a tight junction staining called zona occludens one. So it looks at tight junctions. So anytime you have tight junctions in, the, in a cell setup, what it is is you, you have cells that are very close together. They want to form a junction, a tight junction, which is like a seal. So things can't get past, okay? So can anybody think of a good place in the body where you really need a seal like a, to stop things from passing? Any ideas? Like maybe like, like your intestines, right? You eat the food. You don't want the food to just, you know, go out of your gut right into your blood. You, so your, your intestines have, especially your small intestines, have a lot of tight junctions to, to keep everything from passing through, okay? But this happens to be in the retina pigment epithelium of the, uh, of the retina. Now, the problem is here is if you look, they want to do image analysis on the size of these things. And the problem is, is the prep, it's really hard to, I mean, retina is very gentle, very delicate kind of piece of tissue. So what happens is, is when you take it apart, a lot of times it's not real flat like you'd hope. So if you see here, I'm going through Z, and you see I got a lot of different sections, right? But what was the trick to smash all the cards together? Do you remember? We said if you got the whole deck of cards and you go, turn it into one card, what do we call that? Max projection. You might win a prize tomorrow at this rate. You're doing good. I don't know what I got left. I, I know I got at least a couple things left. Max projection. Not if I remember where max projection is. Okay, stack arithmetic. Okay, so it'd be really hard for me to do image analysis on the stack like this. But if I did a max projection, now I can sort of see the the outline's a lot better, right? So sometimes what you want to do is you want to take that stack, things aren't flat, and then you can do like a max projection on it, okay? But here now we'd actually sort of see and we could actually, you know, we could probably go around and draw if we had to around here and measure the areas of the, uh, of the different cells, okay? Does anybody have any questions? Any questions? questions? Okay, so I'm probably going to go over to Confocal. Some people are bringing some samples about now. So I guess if you'd like to tag along, feel free to come over and watch us work on that. If not, I guess we'll call it a day and we'll meet again tomorrow. Does that sound good? Everybody good with that? Okay. And like if you want to, like I said, I'm going to go over and work on a Confocal for a little bit. Uh, somebody brought some samples. We're going to take a glance at them. Again, if you have any pictures, if you want to bring in tomorrow, we might have some time to work on it. Uh, I think tomorrow's schedule, though. Let's see what we got going on. What's tomorrow? <laughs> tomorrow's Friday, right? It's been a long week for me, believe me. There's a lot of teaching. Huh? Tomorrow will be the 3rd of March. What do you guys call the 15th of March? Do you have a name for the 15th of March? 15th of March? We call it the Ides of March. It's a day that, like, Julius Caesar got killed. So, like, in America, we go around and go, oh, it's the Ides of March. It's, like, a bad day, bad luck day. The Ides of March. 14th of March is my wedding anniversary, so that's a good one. That's a good day. <laughs> so what should I bring my wife back from here? What do you guys think? Any ideas, any opinions from you ladies? Like, what should I bring my wife back? Any ideas? What do you think would be a nice gift? Any ideas? A what? He wants to take something, for take something back from my wife. Oh, okay. So I was asking the, the, the women in the audience here, any thoughts so I don't do something stupid, okay? So any ideas what I could take? What's a good gift? It comes with a list of tomorrow. Right, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 the,
Exactly. Uh, okay, so tomorrow looks like we'll have a little more time to do some confocal because we'll actually be able to break into groups with the electron microscope and stuff. So that'll be nice. And I don't speak at all. That's a break for you, sir. How could that be? Oh, I am going to speak because Therese came up with another topic for me to talk about. I'm going to talk about the staining tomorrow. Okay, so I, I'm not off the hook. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to go work on the confocal. If you want to come on over and watch, feel free. If not, you know, you're done for the day. So go do what you got to do. If you got any questions for me, find me. I'll be around. Uh, and then the last day for sure, I'll definitely give you my email when I'm going back to America. I'm not going to be working much longer at my job, but I'll give you my email where I'm going to be, and you can get a hold of me. Okay, so if you want to come to Confocal, come on over. If you don't, I'll see you tomorrow.